Hello Flight Simmers and welcome back to Alpha Hotel Flight Simulator Training. This video is part three of our sixth flight lesson in the instrument training series focusing on flying an instrument landing system or ILS approach. In part one we talked about the basic components of the system and how they operate. In the second part we conducted a demonstration of flying an ILS approach in the G1000 equipped Cessna 172. And in this video we'll demonstrate the differences of flying the ILS in the Cessna 172 classic analog or steam gauge panel. Before we get started, I'll mention that to use the Cessna 172 Classic Analog or Steam Gauge panel, you need to have the Deluxe Edition of Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's not available if you don't have or purchase this edition of the sim. If you haven't already done so, you'll also want to watch video number one of this series, which you can find here, and I'll also leave a link to the video in this video's description. Again, video number one talks about the basic components of the ILS, how they operate, and how to use them. I'll also leave a link to video number two in this lesson series, which is the ILS demo flight in the Cessna 172 G1000 edition. If you haven't done so, it's also a good idea to watch the videos on the basics of instrument flying and the fundamentals of instrument approaches, which covers how instrument approaches work and how to read instrument approach charts. You'll also want to be familiar with the basics of using VORs, NDBs, and distance measuring equipment, or DME. Since the 172 Classic is equipped with a Garmin GNS 530 and a GNS 430, it's also a good idea to be familiar with those units. Just like with the G1000 in the last video, we won't be using the GPS navigation features on those units to shoot the approach, but we will be using many of the other features of those units. So you, if you want to brush up on how to operate them, check out the video series on those units. I'll leave a link to all those videos, plus a link to the entire instrument training series in this video video's description. I'll also mention that if you view the G1000 ILS demo flight video, some portions of this video will be repeats of that video. The route briefing, the approach briefing, and the weather setup are identical to that video, uh, so those are parts that you can feel free to skip if you've seen the first video, and I'll try to put some markers in this video uh, at those points so you can skip ahead if you'd like to do that. To demonstrate flying an ILS, we'll conduct a short IFR flight between Butler Memorial Airport and Butler, Missouri. The identifier for that airport is Kilo Bravo Uniform Mike to New Century Air Center in Olathe, Kansas, just south of Kansas City. The identifier for that airport is Kilo India X-Ray Delta. We'll plan to fly the ILS to runway 36 at New Century Air Center. After departing from Butler Memorial, we'll plan to fly direct to the Butler Vortac, which is an initial approach fix for the ILS. We'll then take the 309 degree radial to Friel's intersection, where we'll intercept the localizer and fly the approach in. Our filed route will be Butler Airport, direct to Butler Vortac, which is an identifier of Bravo Uniform Mike, the Butler Vortac 309 degree radial to Friel's intersection, direct to New Century Air Center. This is probably a more exact route than I would file in real life, and I've done it mostly for the sake of keeping clearances simple. A more realistic real-life route would probably be something like Butler Airport direct to Butler Vortac and then direct to New Century Air Center. And then once we were airborne, we would let the controller know that we'd like to fly the approach using the Butler Vortac as our initial approach fix. But again, for the sake of keeping clearances simple, we'll assume that we filed the route listed. We'll file for an altitude of 4,000 feet, which will keep us above the off-route obstruction clearance altitude in this area and above the initial procedure altitudes on the approach. The flight is just over 48 track miles and will take around a half an hour to fly in the 172, though you can save the flight once you're established on the localizer about five miles from the glide slope intercept if you'd like to practice shooting multiple approaches in quick succession. We'll plan to depart runway 36 at Butler Memorial. We've checked the takeoff and departure procedures for that airport, and there are takeoff minimums and obstacle notes, but no special departure procedures. So we know we'll be safe using the standard diverse departure procedure of flying runway heading to 400 feet AGL before making a turn on course. 
We'll assume that the weather at Butler Airport is good enough that we can get back in on the RNAV approach that they have there and that we feel comfortable departing. The weather at New Century Airport is reported as calm winds, one half statute mile visibility in mists, a ceiling of 300 overcast, a temperature and dew point of 15 degrees C, and an altimeter of 2992. We'll assume that we filed an alternate for the flight and that it is a legal alternate. So let's take a look at the chart and look at the details on here that we need to be aware of as we plan to shoot this approach. First, we'll verify that we're looking at the right approach plate. We can see over here at the right, it's got the title of the approach and the airport. So this is the ILS or localizer approach to runway 36. So this tells us that this approach chart is for the ILS approach and for the localizer without the glide slope as well. So there are two different uh, sets of information on this chart and we need to be aware of what is for the ILS and what is just for the localizer. Uh, confirms that we are looking at the right airport. We're planning to go to New Century Air Center with an identifier of IXD. Uh, we'll start at the top left over here and look at all the information and kind of go uh, left to right and then down uh, from top to bottom. It tells us that the primary uh, nav aid for this approach is the localizer DME. So it is a localizer with DME uh, with an identifier of I IXD. It tells us that the frequency for this localizer is going to be 10.9 and that the channel is 46 for the TACAN channel, which just tells civilian users that it is DME equipped. We can't do anything with that channel. It uh, reiterates that information on the plan view. It bolds the box to tell you that this is the primary nav aid for the approach. It's a localizer, frequency 10.9, gives you the identifier and gives you the Morse code. If we weren't using a G1000 that had a digital identifier that can tell us uh, what the, the ID is on the screen. And again, it gives us a channel which tells us it has DME. Tells us that the approach course on the final approach course is 356 and that that's re re reiterated on the plan view of the chart down here. Then it gives us some information about the airport. Tells us that the runway landing distance is 7339. So just a little over 7,000 feet of pavement uh, to get our aircraft landed and stopped on. Tells us that the touchdown zone elevation for this airport or for this runway is 1067. That's going to be the highest point in the first 3,000 feet of this runway. And then the airport elevation is 1087, so 20 feet higher. And that's going to be the highest elevation of any point on any usable runway. So moving down to our approach notes, we can see in the top left corner it has this black T that tells us that it has non-standard takeoff minimums or a special departure procedure or obstacle notes for taking off out of this airport. None of this is a factor for us uh, as an arrival to this airport. If we decide to leave again from the airport, uh, then we'll need to look it up and see what that's all about. But as an arrival, this does not uh, really concern us. Uh, it tells us that the procedure does require DME, so we do need a DME-equipped aircraft to be able to legally shoot this approach, and then that is reiterated down here uh, on the plan view. And then it tells us that if we have inoperative uh, approach lighting system, or ALS, uh, we have a non-standard increase uh, to the visibility minimums for CAT C and D aircraft. That is not a factor for us as the approach lights are working in Flight Simulator. It tells us what kind of approach lighting system we have. It is a Mauser, which is the white T with the sequence flashing lights at the beginning or the rabbit. Uh, and that is designated as an A5, which is uh, reiterated on the uh, airport diagram down here. It then tells us the missed approach procedure. So if we get to our decision altitude and we don't see anything or we need to de or we determine that we need to miss the approach prior to that, uh, the procedure is to climb straight ahead to 2,700 feet, then make a climbing left turn to 4,000. Uh, we'll intercept the Topeka, Topeka Vortac uh, 107 degree radial and track that to rugby intersection, which can be identified on that radial. Uh, at the 25 DME from Kansas City VOR. So a little bit of a complicated fix to determine the position of. Uh, we need to be aware of that before we go missed approach. It reiterates all that down here in the graphical depiction of missed, the missed approach straight ahead to 2,700 feet. Then we'll make a left turn to 4,000 feet, intercept the Topeka uh, radial 107, and take that to rugby.
Uh, it also has the missed approach fix depict over here, depicted over here in an inset box over here. And then we also have an alternate missed approach procedure that uh, ATC could potentially assign us where we would go back down to Friel's intersection and hold down there. Below that, we have all the communications frequencies that we'll need to fly the approach. We're not going to be worrying about this too much today. We'll be kind of simulating air traffic control uh, rather than using the in-game air traffic control. But it has our weather station uh, at 135325. The approach control for this approach is going to be Kansas City Approach Control. It gives us the frequencies for that. New Century uh, Tower will be the uh, facility we would be using while we're actually on the bulk of the approach uh, when we're flying the final approach segment. Uh, so that is put in bold, then ground control after that, and then Unicom, if we need to call and ask somebody about fuel services, is right there. So looking at the plan view, we have multiple feeder routes coming in from VORs in the area, and these little squiggly lines here ind indicate that the uh, distance from the VOR uh, on the chart is not depicted to scale, so these VORs are probably out over here. Uh, somewhere. Uh, we are not going to use any of these feeder routes. They all go to skinny intersections, so, but uh, none of these are a factor for us. Again, it depicts the uh, localizer as the primary approach aid, which we already talked about. Uh, and then you'll notice that the approach has a procedure turn on it, but if you look at the route that we'll be taking from the initial approach fix of Butler VOR, uh, it depicts no PT on that route, uh, so we do not have to fly the procedure turn. We just fly in, intercept the localizer, and then fly on in on the localizer from there. Other things that we want to be aware of on the chart, it does have obstacles depicted. We have a couple over here by the airport. And again, the altitudes depicted are the elevations or the altitudes of the top of the obstacles, MSL, or what would what it would read on your altimeter if you were to hit the top of that obstacle. Uh, so we've got the two over here by the airport, fairly close to the approach course. So we need to be aware of those. And then we have the largest one, which is depicted with a larger symbol and larger numbers over here. And the height of that obstacle or the altitude of the top of that obstacle is 2048. Uh, and it's way over here by Topeka, so not really that much of a factor for us. We have the missed approach fix and the alternate missed approach fix again depicted over here. Does have water depicted on the chart as we talked about in our previous videos. Reminds us that DME is required. And then down here in the bottom right is our uh, MSA, our minimum sector altitude. This is again a, a altitude that we know we can go uh, this low if we are within the distance depicted from the nav aid depicted uh, in an emergency. You don't want to go to, the, to that altitude uh, unless you have clearance from ATC to descend. Uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, case here because you can see it is uh, from uh, Kansas City VOR and it is 29 nautical miles. Well, Kansas City VOR is way up here and 29 nautical miles from that would be about right there. So our MSA sector is way up here. Uh, so really, if we are, you know, we don't have any sort of uh, information about other than the off route obstacle clearance altitude, but how we can how low we can go uh, if we're somewhere over here, if we're not on a published segment of the, the approach. So that's kind of important to note there. And looking at the actual route that we'll be flying on the approach here, uh, again, Butler uh, Vortac is an initial approach fix so we can navigate to it and then uh, fly in on the approach from there. Uh, 15.9, it gives the identifier in the channel so we know it has DME. And then we can look at our depicted route. It's bolded so we know it is part of the approach. Uh, so we know once we're established on this segment, we are established on the approach. And uh, if we're cleared via approach, all the approach altitudes or procedure altitudes are then altitudes we can descend to. So the procedure altitude for this segment of the approach is 2,700 feet. So if we're at 4,000 feet, we get to Butler VOR. We get cleared for the approach once established. Once we're on that 309 degree radial, we can go ahead and descend down to 2,700 feet. Again, it tells us we don't need to do the procedure turn where we're coming in from this direction. Uh, the course here is 309 to get to our next uh, point on the approach. And it tells us this is also the 309 degree radial from Butler Vortag. 
and then it tells us that the distance of this segment is 27.3 nautical miles. So we'll fly this uh, until we get to 27.3 nautical miles. Uh, that is Friel's intersection. It's identified on that VOR radial at 27.3 nautical miles, which it tells us right down here. And we can also tell that we're at that intersection when we are at the intersection of that radial and the localizer, and also when we are 14.6 DME uh, from the localizer uh, on on that localizer course. Uh, so that is Friel's intersection. That's where we will intercept the glide slope. Then it depicts the course going from Friel's intersection to skinny intersection. Again, it gives us altitude, procedure altitude. So this is something that if we are cleared for the approach and established on that part of the, the uh, approach segment, then we can go down to that altitude, tells us the course 356. So we are on the localizer course at this point. And it tells us it's 8.2 nautical miles from this intersection to the next depicted intersection, which is skinny intersection. Uh, these intersections are pretty much depicted on here for the localizer approach. They are not necessarily anything that we'll be using for the ILS approach, but skinny intersection can be identified with 6.4 DME from the uh, localizer transmitter. And the SIAT intersection uh, can be identified as 2.9 DME from the localizer uh, transmitter. So looking at the plan view, it tells us in the bottom left-hand corner that the glide slope is a standard three-degree glide slope, which will affect the uh, rate of descent that we need to use uh, as we are coming down. It is a standard glide slope, though, so we can use the standard rate of descent for a three-degree glide slope. It tells us that the threshold crossing height, if we are on that glide slope, is 55 feet, so we will cross the runway threshold at 55 feet above the runway uh, if we are on the glide slope. It shows us uh, what we would do if we were using the procedure turn that we can hit skinny and then descend down to 2,700 feet, but we are not doing procedure turn. So that is not applicable to us. Neither is the remain within 10 nautical miles. That is for the procedure turn. And then it tells us that the platform altitude is 2,700 feet. That is where we intercept the glide slope. And that is the final approach fix for the ILS is when we intercept the glide slope at 2,700 feet. That's depicted with this little kind of lightning bolt symbol here. We also cross the skinny intersection at uh, 2,700 feet, which means that the uh, final approach fix for the ILS and the final approach fix for the localizer, which is depicted with this Maltese cross, just happen to be in the same place, but they are not always in the same place. Uh, you can see the glide slopes depicted going on down, but the rest of these symbols have to do with the localizer uh, approach. So this Zayat intersection and the altitude we should cross there, and the visual descent point and the missed approach point are all just for the localizer. We do not use those for the ILS. Looking at the minimums, we have three sets of minimums. The first one is for the straight-in ILS approach to runway 36, and that's what we will be using. Then you have the minimums for the localizer approach only, uh, if you're using the localizer without the glide slope, and then you have circling minimums. You can see that the, uh, pro the minimums for the ILS straight into ILS to 36 is going to be the same for all categories of aircraft, A, B, C, and D. No differences in the categories and what the minimums are gonna be. The decision altitude, again, this is a decision altitude since this is a precision approach. On this approach is going to be 1,267 feet MSL. So that is what, uh, when we get to that altitude on our altimeter, uh, we're going to need to go missed approach if we don't have anything in sight uh, at that point. Uh, it tells us over here that this is a standard 200 foot height above touchdown uh, zone elevation. So this is a standard uh, ILS decision altitude that is 200 feet above the touchdown zone elevation. It tells us that the visibility we need to shoot the approach and to land from the approach is one half statute nautical mile. And finally, looking at the airport diagram, it uh, gives us the airport elevation again and the touchdown zone elevation. It gives us a runway diagram with the lengths and widths of both usable runways, uh, tells us where all the runways are, tells us what the tower is and how high it is and uh, tells us what the approach lighting system is for this runway. You'll notice that there is a PAPI and a VASI on every other runway, but for runway 36, we do not have any sort of visual uh, approach slope indicator. Uh, no, no other glide slope other than the electronic glide slope we get from the ILS transmitter. It also shows us where the uh, approach comes in from. It's a standard ILS, so it is a straight-in approach. 
It's five nautical miles from the final approach fix. That's actually for the localizer approach, although it happens to coincide with where the final approach fix is on, on the ILS. And then it tells us about the runway lights for each of the runways. All right, so to set up from this flight, we will go from the world map and we will work uh, left to right like we usually do. So for the aircraft selection, you want to make sure that you have the Textron Aviation System 172 Skyhawk. The Arista Blue is just a livery that I downloaded from flightsim.to, so that's not something you need to see. But you do want to make sure that you do not have the Cessna 172 Skyhawk G1000. Uh, to shoot it with the steam gauge panel, you want this Cessna 172 with no G1000 in there. Uh, and again, if you do not have the deluxe version of the sim, then you will not see this aircraft in your aircraft selection. You do need, do need to have or purchase the deluxe edition to be able to access this aircraft. Liveries is up to you. Weight and balance, we'll go ahead and go with uh, two full tanks there, and then we'll have the two uh, passengers at 170 pounds, so that'll be good there. No failures, and then the customization, you can do whatever you'd like with the end number and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then for departure airport, we will select uh, Butler Memorial, which is a Kilo Bravo Uniform Mike. And there you see Butler Memorial. We'll go ahead and click on that. That'll zoom us in. And you can either start on runway 36 if you want to start on the runway and not have to worry with uh, startup and taxi, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to go ahead and start it over on the ramp area uh, so we can do some setup on the ramp before we taxi out for departure. As far as uh, time and date, we're going to set a mid-June day and we'll go back out here and we'll set it up for about noon and this is all for lighting conditions and then that's all we need to set up for the flight in the world map we'll go ahead and click on fly and get the weather and the aircraft set up all right so we've spawned into the flight now let's talk about setting up the weather the first thing i would recommend doing is going and eliminating any wind layers i would recommend flying your first ils in a calm wind setting especially as finicky as custom winds can be in flight simulator the next thing we'll do is go in and set up our clouds what i recommend doing is setting the base of your clouds well first you want to set your coverage to 100 percent so you get overcast leave the density at 1.0 uh, that should be good. Scatter at zero is fine as well. And what we're going to do here is we're going to put our bases a thousand feet underneath our decision altitude. 1267 is the decision altitude at New Century. So we will put this at 267 and delete that zero there. And that will give us a cloud layer that will have us breaking out uh, on the approach about 100 feet above decision altitude or so. Uh, so that's good for the cloud layer. The tops I would set probably at least at uh, 10,000. It depends on whether or not you want to be on top or in the instrument uh, conditions uh, when you are at your cruise altitude of 4,000 feet. Uh, remember that you generally need to add about 3,000 feet to what you put into the tops as to where the tops will actually be. Uh, so if you want them at, say, 3,000, you probably want to put them up around 7,000 feet. If you put them up around 10,000 feet, you should not break out. You should be in instrument conditions the entire time. Xing out of that and going to the rest of the settings, I do recommend putting the cloud settings to above mean sea level. That way the cloud base will not vary as you fly over different areas. If you want to throw in just a little bit of precipitation, like 0.02 or so, just for like kind of an effect, uh, then you can do that. Obviously we won't have any snow depth. Don't recommend going flying with lightning. I would pump the temperature up to about uh, 70 or 71. That will put it as a uh, 20 degrees C surface temperature in Butler and in uh, Olathe. And that will give you 10,000 feet uh, before you encounter any icing conditions. Uh, pressure, uh, I just keep it standard at 2992 just to simplify things. And the humidity, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter what you do here. This is would affect the visibility a bit. So I guess I recommend leaving that at 1. And, uh, and then you should be set. This should be a good setting for shooting the approach and breaking out, again, about 100 feet above decision altitude. I'll also mention once you have the weather settings where you like them, you can click on this double folder here if you'd like to recall them quickly and save them as a preset. You can either save them to cloud storage or save them to your computer or Xbox. I'm just going to call this uh, ILS36KXID. Whoops, KXID. And then I will save to my PC. And then if I want to pull this weather back up again and quickly set it, all I have to do 
is pull up that preset and uh, load that up and it will go from you know nice calm VFR to uh, IFR weather. All right, so we spawned onto the ramp and I went ahead and got the uh, engine started and I uh, go, went ahead and got the avionics booted up here. So now let's go through kind of a setup process for setting up for this approach. Uh, it's always a good idea when you're flying IFR to try to stay as far ahead of the aircraft as you can. And that means setting up for uh, things like approaches uh, when you're in a low workload phase of flight like prior to departure or when you're in cruise flight rather than trying to do it when you're on a high workload phase of flight such as climb or descent or you're about ready to shoot the approach. Uh, so we'll go ahead and set up as much of this as we can while we're on the ground here at Butler. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the transponder to standby. We'll call up and get the clearance here in just a little bit and get our squawk code in there. I'm going to go ahead on the autopilot and I'm going to go ahead and set up my initial uh, cruise altitude which is 4,000 feet and that's all we need to do uh, for the uh, autopilot. I'll go ahead and change my navigation sources on my GPS's to over to Vorlock. This is a very important step here because if you don't do this, then your nav displays up here, your nav radios are displaying GPS course data and not uh, a localizer or VOR data and you're not going to get an accurate course information from that. So you need to always double check that these are in the right setting, either VLOC if you're using a VOR or localizer, or in GPS mode if you're shooting a GPS approach. We'll go ahead and set up our nav radios. I'll stop start with the top one, uh, so I'll go ahead and hit the CV button to get it down here. We're going to put in uh, 15.9 for Butler VOR there, so we'll dial that in. You'll notice that the flag comes alive and the uh, needle comes alive there so we're actually receiving it you can see we have a good identifier down here and it tells us our radial and you can see we get DME information from that as well uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and turn this uh, to see what radial I'm currently on it's saying the 080 degree radial but this is usually just a little bit off uh, so this will give us a good indication of where we are in relation to the VOR and what course we need to take up roughly after we take off to go uh, direct to the VOR. So it looks like I'm on about the 075 degree radial. It looks like about a 255 uh, heading somewhere around and that ballpark is going to take me direct to the VOR once I get airborne. Uh, then for the standby frequency here, I'm going to go ahead and load in the uh, ILS localizer frequency here. So that is ready to go for me uh, once I uh, get to where I'm ready to intercept the localizer on this procedure. For the bottom uh, VOR radios here for number two, I'm going to go ahead and put 159 uh, in there, which is again Butler Vortac. So I'll bring that up to the top. And what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to turn it to that 309 degree radial. Uh, so that's ready to go uh, once we get airborne to show me where I am in relation to that once I pass the VOR. So that's good to go there. I always want to do something with that other frequency, that standby frequency. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a Topeka VOR, which is the VOR we would use if we go missed approach out of uh, New Century off the ILS. So that'll be in my standby right there. Uh, other things that I want to do, I want to set up the heading indicator. So I'm going to set it up to runway heading. Uh, so that is dialed into 360 there. So that looks like it is good to go. I'm also going to change the uh, OAT and voltmeter so that it is indicating my temperature in degrees Celsius. That way I have an awareness of the temperature outside and whether I'm getting close to uh, the freeze level or not. And then on the bottom, I'm going to take this and change it over to the elapsed timer uh, so that I could do timing if I wanted to, uh, say, if I got up to New Century and they tell us that the uh, localizer or the, the glide slope is out of service, I could switch over to and fly a localizer approach instead. You also want to go ahead and set up your lighting so that you like it. I have a little bit of glare shield light on and the, the instrument backlights, uh, mostly so that it comes out across clearly in the video but just go through and set up the lights like you like you want them I also have the marker beacon uh, receiver turned on so that I will hear the marker beacons uh, and that's uh, there's not actually a marker beacon depicted on this approach uh, but uh, it does actually have a marker beacon on the system in flight simulator 
Uh, it looks like maybe it was decommissioned a while back, and it's still in Flight Simulator. So I'll just go ahead and leave the marker beacon uh, audio on so I can hear that when I pass overhead. And one kind of unique feature of the GNS uh, 430 and 530 units is you do get DME uh, when you put a VOR frequency in there, but if you put a localizer frequency in there, it changes so that it gives you the identifier and then gives you the runway and the course information and gets rid of the DME information. Working title did not change this when they uh, upgraded the uh, unit because they want to emulate how the unit actually works and not make changes uh, to make it work like it doesn't actually work in real life so this is actually emulating what it works like in real life but that does mean in order to get distance information from the uh, localizer transmitter we're going to have to do a little bit of a cheat here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, hit the direct key and then I'll hit the keyboard here to enter an identifier and I'm going to enter IIXD which is the identifier for the localizer transmitter up there in New Century for runway 36 you can see it says ILS runway 36 and then I will go ahead and activate that so I'll enter, enter, enter once it will flash activate I'll hit enter again and it will give me distance information and the way I'm going to set these screens up so I don't use the moving map uh, for navigation so I'm actually using the old school nav aids is I'm going to put this on nav page number five which is the uh, GPS integrity uh, page there uh, so that won't give us any kind of navigational information and then I'm going to put the GNS 430 onto nav page number uh, one which will give us uh, the distance information that we want to that uh, localizer uh, transmitter and it will give us some track information uh, for the aircraft's track which will also be helpful but it won't give us any sort of a cheat to look at a moving map so if we look at the uh, approach chart for the RNAV into uh, Butler Memorial, we'll see that there is a approach control frequency of 125.55. This is actually Kansas City Center, so the en route control center. I don't know if you can actually receive that on the ground at but Butler Memorial, but we will pretend for our purposes that we can. If you couldn't, there's actually a remote communications outlet with flight service there in Butler uh, Memorial as well that you could use in real life. But we'll just assume that we can talk to Kansas City Center. So we call them up and ask for our IFR clearance up to New Century Air Center. They call back and say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, you're cleared to New Century Air Center as filed. Enter controlled airspace heading 360, climb and maintain 4000, squawk 5502. So we read that clearance back to them, and because this is an uncontrolled field, they tell us that we'll have to hold for our IFR release. They tell us just uh, taxi up to the runway and let us know when we're number one and ready to depart, and they'll give us our IFR release. So with everything set up, we taxi out, do our run-up, and then call Kansas City Center for our IFR release. We'll assume they release us and give us a clearance void time that we need to be airborne by. We then make our departure from runway 36 and leaving 400 feet AGL, fly a heading of 360 as assigned. So once we've got it stabilized on the autopilot, we're climbing through about 1,000 feet. We'll go and switch over to and contact Kansas City. And we'll assume the con Kansas City says uh, Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, radar contact, climb and maintain 4,000. So we read that back and we're using the autopilot in the vertical speed mode to hold it at roughly its uh, best rate of climb speed here uh, and get it on up to 4,000. Somewhere between six and 800 feet per minute should keep it on best rate. Just make sure to keep that airspeed indicator in your scan to make sure that it is not doing something you don't think that it should. Uh, or make sure that it's not uh, slowing down on you. So we'll dial up the VOR here to get ready for our turn. Looks like about a 2.30 heading is going to take us directly to the VOR. A Kansas City calls back up. They say uh, Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel. Left turn, direct Butler VOR, and resume on navigation. So we go ahead and bring this over to about a 2.30 heading. And then once that, set, uh, that uh, centers up, uh, then we can go ahead and engage the VOR tracking mode. As you can see there, uh, looks like uh, 800 feet per minute is what I had in there. That was a little too much. It's getting a little slow, so I'll dial that down to about 500 feet per minute, and that should get it back on speed for us.
Go ahead and center this up again. Looks like about a 225 is what we need. And since it's centered up, I can go ahead and engage the nav mode. You can see it's in nav tracking. And we're about eight miles from the VOR. Uh, so we're tracking over towards the VOR, climbing up to our cruise altitude of 4,000 feet. And the autopilot's taking care of the VOR tracking for us. Once we hit the VOR, we'll go ahead and establish ourselves outbound on that 309 degree radial and start the instrument approach procedure. So we're leveling off at uh, 4,000 feet. We'll let the aircraft accelerate, then we'll set the power. About 2450 seems to work out well for the 172. Uh, once we get to about 100 knots, so we'll do that. We'll go ahead and accomplish our cruise check, and then we'll trace track to the VOR. And once we hit the VOR, we'll start tracking on that uh, 309 degree radial to intercept the localizer course. And I'll mention that I will not bother with lowering, uh, leading the mixture on this particular flight. You could certainly do that if you wanted to. Uh, but uh, since it's going to be not that long before we are descending back down, uh, we're just not going to worry about it with it on this flight. So we're getting close to the VOR. We're at 1.4 DME from the VOR. And of course, with the slant range error, uh, we're going to show about a, a little less than a mile as we pass over the station. I'm going to look for this to flip from the to to the from. And I'm also going to look for this to go into uh, hold mode or the roll hold mode. That's an indication that we've passed the station. And then at that time, I'm going to put it in heading mode and turn to that 309 heading outbound to track that radial outbound, intercept and track that radial outbound. OK, so there's the flip. I'm going to go ahead and put it into heading mode. You can see it went into roll hold mode. I'm going to go ahead and turn over to 309 here. And then we'll see where we are in relation to that radial. I can use this bottom VOR to see where we are in relation to that radio because I've already set it up. I am going to track with the primary though. So I'm going to go ahead and twist this over to that 309 over here. So there's 310, there's 309. And it looks like I am a little bit to the left of the radial. So I'll go ahead and correct over to about a 320 heading. Again, we're only about a mile from the VOR, so I don't want to do a super aggressive intercept here. And then I can actually use this bottom radial or this bottom radio to see uh, where I am in relation to the VOR to see what radial I'm actually on right now. So it looks like I'm actually on about the 285 degree radial and it's coming through fairly quickly. Uh, so it looks like this is a good intercept heading for us. So we'll just keep that heading and uh, again I'm going to kind of twist this over here to see and now I'm coming through it looks like the 300 degree radial. So you can see it's swinging through fairly quickly. This is a good intercept heading for us. And then once this needle starts to move and gets close to centered up I'll go ahead and get on that heading uh, and then engage the nav mode on the autopilot. So 300 or so degrees is centering up there. That means that needle's gonna start coming alive up there. That looks good. So I'll get ready to go ahead and fly that course here in just a second as it centers up. All right, so it's mostly center up there. I'm gonna go ahead and start rotating over towards the heading to track it. And I'm going to go ahead and activate the nav tracking mode. You can see it's now in nav tracking mode, so it's going to take care of keeping that VRR radial centered for now. Once I get a little closer to the intercept point, I'll put it back into heading mode, and I'm going to monitor the radial down here on the bottom radio. And then I'll flip this over here uh, to the ILS frequency so I can monitor the, inter the uh, localizer intercept. So from this point, we'll just track the 309 degree radial uh, up to the intercept of the localizer, and then it will be time to prepare to fly the approach. So as we're tracking inbound on the initial approach leg of this approach, let's go ahead and talk about some specific techniques that we're going to use in the 172 uh, in the 172 Classic to fly this approach. The first thing I want to talk about is automation, the use of automation. Uh, in the 172 Classic, it's pretty straightforward. We only have two choices. There is autopilot on or autopilot off. 
Uh, some people will tell you that there's no value in flying it with the autopilot, uh, that you're not going to learn anything or uh, enhance your skills. I disagree with that. I think that the first time you fly the approach, if it's your first time to attempt an ILS, it is a good idea to fly it with the autopilot. Uh, there are two reasons for this. The first is it allows you to concentrate basically solely on throttle input and getting the throttle input correct and fine-tuning your throttle inputs uh, to get the correct speed as you're both level and as you uh, fly down the glide slope. And the second is because it allows you to observe the autopilot and observe the type of pitch and roll and heading corrections it makes to keep itself tracking on the localizer and the glide slope. It is going to do it correctly. It will do it in a fine-tuned way. Uh, it's going to be very precise about it. And if you can watch that and then emulate that, uh, that is helpful for learning how to fly the ILS. Uh, I think there is a good argument to be made for an intermediate step to go to the Cessna 172 G1000 uh, equipped aircraft and to fly this approach using no autopilot but keeping the flight director on. That way you are hand flying everything but you're getting uh, visual cues as to how you should correct your pitch and your roll and your heading. Uh, so I think that's a good intermediate step if you want to do that, if you haven't done so already. And then you can step back in the 172 Classic and try the approach with no autopilot. Uh, the second question is where do you turn the autopilot off? And of course that is up to you. You can fly the entire uh, route, you know, from 400 feet above the ground at Butler Memorial to 200 feet above the ground at New Century Airport with the autopilot if you want, or you can hand fly the entire thing. Uh, if you are new to flying ILS approaches and it's your first time to attempt to high and fly, what I would recommend is we're going to use the low speed approach technique, which means we're going to get about three miles from glide slope intercept. And then we are going to configure the aircraft and slow it to the approach speed while we're level at the platform altitude. So once you have slowed the aircraft and got it configured uh, for landing and you have stabilized it at that platform altitude and at approach speed, that's a good time to go ahead and turn the autopilot off if you want to hand fly it. So let's take a look at uh, some specific techniques that we're going to use in the Cessna 172 Classic to fly this specific approach. So when we get about three miles from the glide slip intercept point, which is about 9.4 DME from the localizer transmitter, and remember we don't have a DME display on the GNS 530 when we have a localizer dialed in, so that's why we put in the localizer ID in the GNS 530 and 430. We'll get the mileage off of that instead. So when that says 9.4 on the GPS, then we will go ahead and just start to configure for landing and for the approach. What we'll do is bring the power to 1800 RPMs. We'll hold altitude and allow the aircraft to slow. We should already be below 110 knots, but if we're not, we'll wait until we're below 110 knots and then bring the flaps to 10. Then we'll allow the aircraft to continue to slow as we hold altitude. And when we get to 85 knots of indicated airspeed, we'll bring the flaps in to 30 incrementally. So first to 20, pause for a second, let, us, let it stabilize, and then to 30. About the time you get it to 30 degrees, you're going to be probably slowing through about 75 knots. So you'll want to go ahead and bring your power back in. Uh, you'll want to maintain 70 knots uh, of indicated airspeed while you're level at 2,700 feet. And this should take about 2,200 to 2,400 RPM. Once you are stabilized in level flight at 70 knots, then you'll want to make your decision about your autopilot. If you want it off, this is a good time to go ahead and turn it off. You also want to make sure you accomplish your before landing checklist. And this is also typically where you get handed off to the control tower and get your landing clearance. So once the glide slope centers up and you intercept that, you'll want to bring your power back to about 1800 to 2000 RPMs. This should give you about a 400 foot per minute descent at 70 knots. From there, you want to make very small changes in pitch, power, and heading to track the localizer and the glide slope. No more than a few degrees of pitch, no more than a couple of hundred RPM changes in power at a time, and no more than about five degrees of bank, and no more than about 10 degrees of heading initially, and no more than about five degrees as you get close to the runway. You want to use those small corrections to track the localizer and the glide slope all the way down to decision altitude, which is 1267 on this approach. 
And then once you get to decision altitude, you want to transition outside and see if you've got your visual cues in sight. If you do have those visual cues in sight, you can go ahead and transition to a visual landing or uh, you execute a missed approach anytime it is appropriate. A technique that I use to uh, track a localizer when I'm using an, an old school uh, analog uh, instrument system like is in the 172 Classic is to use the heading bug and line that up with the initially the course heading for the localizer uh, so that I know where to put my heading, what should keep it still in a zero wind condition. And then if I find that I need a different heading uh, to keep the, the localizer from moving, I will then move the heading bug, say if I have a significant crosswind. And uh, once I find that new heading, then I will use that to keep the localizer needle from moving. And then I'll make corrections uh, left and right of that uh, to get the localizer centered back up. And then I'll return to that heading bug uh, once I have the needle centered again. Uh, the other trick that you can use in the 172 Classic, since it does have the GNS 530 and 430, and uh, it does show your aircraft's ground track uh, in the data fields, or you, that is one of the fields you can display, uh, the ground track will tell you what your aircraft is tracking across the ground. And in real life, you can actually use that to line up with, as long as your track and your course on your localizer are the same number, uh, then that localizer should not move. Uh, and then you can go left and right of that to get the needle centered back up again. It is just a little bit off in Flight Simulator, just a couple of degrees. Uh, so it doesn't always exactly line up exactly with the, the track and the course don't line up exactly and keep the needle still. But it will give you get you in the ballpark and give you an indication of how much wind correction you need to put in to get that need, that localizer needle to stay still. Remember that to track the glide slope, you want to know what descent rate will keep you on the glide slope, which you can get from the FAA climb and descent table, or you can multiply your ground speed times five, or divide it by two and then multiply it by 10 if that's easier for you to get you in the ballpark. The glide slope on this approach is a standard three degree glide slope, so at an approach speed of 70-ish knots, a descent rate of 400 feet per minute should keep you on the glide slope. You want to target that at a descent rate initially as you descend and make adjustments of no more than 100 to 200 feet per minute to keep yourself on the glide slope. Also remember that this descent rate is based on ground speed. So if you have a substantially different ground speed due to a large headwind or tailwind, you'll need to adjust the descent rate. And remember that the rules say that we can descend below the decision altitude if the approach lights are in sight, but the runway is not. But we can't go any lower than 100 feet above the touchdown zone elevation until we get the runway in sight. So if we're looking at our airport, our runway that we're shooting this approach to, the touchdown zone elevation is 1067. At 100 feet to that, we can descend down to 1167 with nothing but the approach lights in sight. But if we don't have that runway environment in sight by the time we get 1167, then we need to go ahead and go missed approach. There are a number of reasons we should miss, execute the missed approach. Uh, some of them we've already talked about, but some of them we have not. Uh, the first we've already talked about in pretty good detail. If the required visual references are not in sight when you get to decision altitude, then you need to go ahead and execute the missed approach. If you acquire the visual references that you need, but they are subsequently lost after you've descended below decision altitude, then you also need to miss the approach. Uh, this does sometimes happen where you break out of one cloud layer you get the runway in sight, but you go through another little fog bank or cloud layer and you lose it uh, below decision altitude, you have to go missed approach. Uh, anytime you get a full scale deviation on the localizer or glide slope without the runway environment in sight, you need to go missed approach. At that point, if it's gone full scale, you don't know how far off course you are at that point. You just know that you are more than full scale. Uh, so without that guidance, you need to go missed approach. It's important to note that on a check ride, the examiner will consider it above a bust if you go beyond a three quarter scale deviation. Uh, so technically, if you get to a three quarter scale deviation and it looks like it's going to go further and you miss the approach, that is technically not a bust. Although don't expect the ex examiner to allow you to do four or five approaches to get it right. You know, they'll probably give you at least one more attempt uh, before saying, okay, you need a little more practice. Uh, 
if the approach becomes unstabilized, if you get too high too fast or your descent rate is, is getting too high to get back on the glide slope, again, not a, not a bust necessarily as long as you call it and execute the mist at that, approach, at that point. And then if any required component of the approach or onboard equipment becomes inoperative, if your nav radio suddenly stops working, uh, then it's time to go missed approach. If the glide slope on the ground suddenly stops transmitting and you get a flag on the glide slope, it's time to go missed and uh, you know go around and consider what you want to do if you want to divert or try a different approach at that airport. And then the last time is any time it becomes unsafe to continue the approach. And this can be a wide variety of conditions uh, and is dependent on the judgment of the pilot. This could be something simple like an airplane pulls out on the runway as you break out of the clouds. It could be something like wind shear or weather, bad weather being in the area. Uh, it could be something with the aircraft. It could even be something with a pilot. But anytime the pilot deems that it's unsafe to continue, then they should execute the missed approach. So assume as we get about 15 miles up the road from Butler VOR that uh, we're handed off to Kansas City Approach Control. And so we check in with them and they say uh, Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, uh, Roger, descend and maintain 2,700. So we'll go ahead and put 2,700 in my altitude select window here. I'm going to go ahead and do a uh, vertical speed descent here. So I will put it in about a 500 foot per minute descent and then I will use power uh, to manage the speed and keep it at the speed that I want and get on down to 2,700 feet. So once I level at 2,700 feet, Kansas City Approach Control calls back and they say Cessna 172 Alpha Hotel, uh, you are five miles from Friel's intersection, maintain 2,700 until established on the approach. You're cleared for the ILS runway 36 New Century Air Center. And so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and change some things up a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and put this, uh, put the autopilot in heading mode. Uh, so heading mode is indicated there, and I'm going to track this VOR radial to the end of the uh, to the intercept point using heading mode and using VOR number two. With VOR number one or nav receiver number one, I'm going to go ahead and flip over to 10.9, which is my localizer frequency. Remember, anytime you change nav radios, you want to tune. Uh, twist and identify. So I'll go ahead and twist this over to the localizer course of 356. And again, this is not doing anything for the nav radio. It doesn't matter what I put this on. Uh, it is going to show the localizer correctly no matter what I put in here. Uh, but this is just as kind of a reminder of what my course heading is. Uh, and then uh, identify, I look down here and I do have a good digital ID with a good two flag, so I know I'm getting a good signal from the right transmitter. And so now I'm going to monitor, I've lost my DME uh, from Butler VOR. All I have is the distance on the GPS from the uh, localizer transmitter. I know that when I get to 14.6, so about a mile and a half, let's see, and so just a little under two miles from now, uh, I will be intercepting the localizer. So I want to pay close attention to this and I want to pay close attention to my localizer. What you want to do with this aircraft is once the localizer starts to center up, you want to turn to the appropriate course heading using the heading mode. Uh, and then once it's centered up, you can go ahead and arm nav again. And then, and actually you could actually arm approach at that time or you can wait and make sure it's tracking the localizer okay and then arm uh, approach after that, which will arm the glide slope. Remember that the, on this autopilot, uh, it is not going to arm nav appropriately. So there's the localizer coming alive, coming across the top. I'm gonna put it to about a 10 degree intercept here until it gets centered up. That makes it come in just a little bit slower. And then once it gets centered up, I'll turn right onto that course heading and engage the nav function. All right, so the localizer's pretty well centering up there. I'll go ahead and turn to the appropriate course heading here, 356. I'll go ahead and engage nav. Make sure it's tracking the localizer okay. And then I'll go ahead and arm approach. And you can see now the glide slope is armed, approach mode is active. It will track the localizer until the glide slope comes down and then it will track the glide slope. 
other things I want to do in getting uh, ready for the approach here. I've got the tower frequency standing by. Uh, I'm going to go ahead with radio number two. I'm going to set that up for the missed approach. I'm going to need Kansas City's DME to identify a missed approach fix. And that's going to be 13.25. So that will be standing by down here. And then we already have Topeka uh, VOR in here. I'm pretty much done with Butler VOR at this point. So I'll get rid of that. So Topeka is uh, standing by there for our missed approach. And you can see we're already receiving that. Now we'll just track the localizer in until we get to about 9.4 miles from the localizer. Then we'll go ahead and configure for the approach and get ready to fly the approach. All right, so here comes uh, 9.4 on the distance. So we'll go ahead and start configuring from the approach. I'll drop the power back to about 1800 RPMs. We're already below our uh, flap 10 speed. So we'll go ahead and put the flaps down to 10. Now we're waiting for 85 knots. Once we get 85 knots, we'll go ahead and put in flaps 20. There's 85, so flaps 20. And wait just a second. Now we'll put in flaps 30. And then we'll go ahead as we get to around 75 knots, push up the power uh, to 2200 to uh, 2400 RPMs to get that um, 70 knots that we want on the speed there. So we'll just adjust the power there. At this time, we'd go ahead and do our landing checklist. So we'll go ahead and get the uh, lights on, run through our landing checklist. And at this time, we'd more than likely be handed over to the control tower and get our landing clearance. So we'll assume all of that ha has happened at well, as well. And at this time, you'd go, want to go ahead and make your decision as to whether or not you want to uh, have your autopilot on or not. This is a good time to go ahead and bring the autopilot off if you want to fly it without the autopilot. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then it's just flying the approach. All right, so as the glide slope centers up here, we're gonna go ahead and reduce our power down to about uh, 1800 to 2000 RPM should be what we need to keep us on speed and on the glide slope. And from there, we'll just make small adjustments on pitch, power, and heading to keep all of those needles centered up and keep ourselves on speed. So we're pulling the power back here, getting a little slow. So we'll need to bring a little bit of power back in there We've caught the glide slope. You can see we've started the descent, putting a little power back in there to catch up on the speed. So now we've got 70 knots dialed in there pretty good. And you can see about 400 feet per minute is keeping us pretty solidly centered on the glide slope. Just a little bit faster, fast, so I'm bringing the power back just a little bit. And continuing to make those very small adjustments in bank, pitch, power, and heading to keep the needle centered up, bearing in mind that as we get closer and closer to the runway, uh, the needles are going to get more and more sensitive. One of the disadvantages of flying the ILS in the 172 Classic is that we don't have uh, any sort of uh, minimum bugs, so we're going to have to peg in our mind. The minimums on this approach are 1267, so about 1270. So right now we're at 2270. Uh, so there's coming through a thousand feet to our minimums right now, about 1200 feet from the ground. Again, continuing to make those very small adjustments. You can see 400 uh, feet per minute down is keeping us dead on the glide slope here. And it looks like with the zero wind situation, a heading of just shy of uh, 360 is keeping that localizer needle centered up for us. I look across from where my minimums were over to the other side uh, and uh, around uh, 770 is going to be 500 feet above. So that's kind of a, a point I'm keeping in my mind to know that I'm getting closer to the minimums. And you can see that heading and that descent rate has kept us is keeping us locked on both the glide slope and the localizer. Another trick you can use is take a look at what your track is. The track, it seems to be a little bit off from what the courses are here. 
uh, but it will give you some indication of how much wind you're dealing with and if you're close to the approach course, close, close to a course that's going to hold the localizer for you. So coming through 500 or uh, just a little bit below 500 feet to men's. Again, it looks like everything is holding us pretty steady. Everything is staying centered up. There's 300 to minimums. See out the corner here, we're getting a little bit of ground contact, but I'm going to keep myself on the instruments until I get about 100 feet above the minimums, then I'll take a quick glance out and see if we can see anything. So right here is going to be 100 to minimums. Everything is still centered up and looking good. There's 100 to minimums. I'll go ahead and take a look outside. And there's the approach lights. I only have the approach lights, so we can come down to 1167 now. And there's the runway threshold coming in sight, so we can go ahead and transition to a visual landing. I would still try to track the glide slope and the localizer until you get over the runway threshold then you can transition to just a plain visual landing. So that is how we fly an ILS on the Cessna 172 Classic with the old school steam gauges. So as far as the certification standards as to what is considered a satisfactory instrument approach when you're taking a check ride or satisfactory ILS approach, those are dictated by the Instrument Airman Certification Standards for the instrument rating. It is Area of Operation 6, Instrument Approaches, Task B, Precision Approaches. And there are, of course, a number of different uh, criteria that are non-numerical, uh, such as selecting the correct approach, identifying the correct decision altitude, tuning in the right radios, all those sorts of things. But as far as the numerical things that we have to uh, adhere to as far as altitudes and air speeds and things like that, it's divided up into two different areas. Uh, if we are prior to the final approach fix, what they are looking for is that we can maintain our assigned altitude plus or minus 100 feet, uh, that we maintain a heading of plus or minus 10 degrees, uh, that we maintain airspeed plus or minus 10 knots, and that we accurately track radials, courses, and bearings. They don't give a numerical value for that, but it's generally considered as long as you're less than full scale deflection on a radial or a localizer course prior to the final approach fix, uh, that is considered acceptable and bearings are within 10 degrees if you're using a bearing pointer or an NDB to navigate. Once you're inside the final approach fix or glide slope interception down to decision altitude, the standards are that you maintain a stabilized approach. Basically, they're looking to make sure that you don't use an excessive rate of descent to try to catch up with the glide slope uh, and that you're not unstabilized at any time. Uh, they allow no more than a three-quarter scale deflection of lateral vertical or vertical course guidance. So no more than three-quarter scale deflection on the localizer or the glide slope is considered acceptable. If it looks like you're three-quarters and looks like you're going to go for further, again, you can declare a missed approach and execute the missed approach procedure. Um, but, you know, don't expect an infinite a number of tries on the approach. You know, if you come back and hit three-quarter scale again and go missed again, eventually the examiner is probably going to say, you know what, you need a little more training before uh, you come back and try to take this check ride. They want to uh, see you maintain your approach airspeed plus or minus 10 knots while you're on the approach. They expect you to immediately initiate missed approach when you get to decision altitude. Generally, the, this is the way this works on a check ride is, you know, 50 to 100 feet above decision altitude. The examiner will say, you know, you you can go ahead and look up and uh, then you can look up and, and make the approach or make the landing. Or they, they will say, as you arrive at decision altitude, I don't see anything. So you need to stay in the cockpit and execute your missed approach procedure. Or uh, if they let you transition to a landing, when you get to decision altitude, you'll, they'll say, I have the approach lights in sight or I have you know the runway threshold in sight. Then you just transition to a visual approach, but you're expected to use a normal rate of descent and normal maneuvering. So that concludes this video and is the conclusion of our video series on ILS approaches. As always, if you've enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell to be alerted to new content. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.